Welcome back to a special edition of the Rudest Wrestling Podcast. I'm blessed to be joined by Olympic and two-time world champ Kyle Snyder, uh, sitting out in State College, not not doing exactly what he wants to be doing at the moment. But you know, I uh, appreciate you jumping on, Kyle. Hope all is well. Yeah, everything's good. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. It's kind of surreal. Two weeks ago, we were actually together shooting your fi- final final Olympic trials videos, marketing promotion videos, getting ready for the, for the Olympic trials and how dramatically things have, have changed in the last two weeks. I think we literally, when we got out there, the news just broke about the NSA tournament. And then, you know, throughout the preceding days, take me through the last two weeks of your, of, in your timeline. Yeah. So I got back from Pan Ams and then I was planning on taking that week off pretty much you know maybe i wrestled light on friday um and then you know i was gonna train wasn't really much left to do you know there was three weeks until the trials after that so um and they started canceling stuff that week and then uh i mean uh on monday we came into practice and uh coaches told us that we couldn't train at rec hall anymore and just uh kind of relax and hang out for a little bit and we'll see what happens kind of take it day by day and then so we weren't able to do anything last week and then this week uh same thing not able to get into the you know rec hall and train and stuff like that so just been relaxing and been able to get into a weight room at an undisclosed location (laughs) (laughs) And then just, uh, I mean, now that the Olympics and the trials and everything are postponed, there's no real, like, sense of urgency to get back on the mat other than the fact that I just like wrestling. So I'd like to wrestle, but that's it. So I guess, you know, when we we got out there a couple weeks ago on the heels of the the Pan Am performance, we were recapping, you know, your wrestling, and you were telling me that's the best you've ever felt in your life. And so, yeah, so talk about the qualifier a little bit first, I guess. I felt really good. Um, and I felt like, I mean, I'm, I, everything is, you know, it's all good that the trials and uh, Olympics are postponed because it's not in my control and it's not in any of our control. And so there's, I don't really have any complaints or anything. It's, it's no big deal. But the one thing that I, uh was excited about was just i just felt like um i felt like with the way that i was wrestling that no one could beat me and it's not like i don't it's not like a cocky or arrogant thing but it's just the way it i i truly believe that and i feel like it's i know it's only going to get better and better and um so i was excited to wrestle in the trials because of that reason um but now just have more time to continue to improve. And uh, there's still a lot of things that I can get better at. And uh, this time will allow me to do it. But I felt, I mean, Solace, the the guys that I wrestled before Solace were pretty good. Solace was the guy that I really wanted to compete against because I had wrestled him once in a weird environment at Beat the Streets. And that was kind of a weird match. Then I wrestled him at the Pan Am Games last year. And I think that was like three to one or three to two. And uh, he's, hard for anybody to score a lot of points on he's athletic and stuff like that but I've, i wrestled uh really well against them and i feel like that's when i take a step forward like that i don't i i don't take step backward i don't go back to where i was after i felt the way that that felt and the way that i competed so i i feel like i was gonna make uh jumps every time that i was gonna compete after that so, so can we actually dig into what, you know, when you're, when you're describing that you've, you've felt better than you've ever felt, what, what, what was it? Was it your motion? Was it a specific technique you've been working on? Was it different setups, parterre, or, or was it a culmination of a bunch of things just coming together and, and, and clicking for you? It's a combination of a lot of different things. Um, I think the most important thing for me is, uh, you know, my faith, and that bleeds into everything that I do in my life. So I know that 
God has, God wants me to wrestle a specific way. He made me uh, a specific way and give, gave me gifts so that I could compete a specific way. And when I do that, I just feel like I have a lot. He, he gives me more energy and he takes away like any fear or doubt or negativity and everything is just so positive before I go out onto the mat. And that's because uh, he knows I'm 100% committed to doing it his way and not the way that I want to do it. And I've had a lot of success probably wrestling the way that I want to do it. And that's when I think about the way that I wrestle, I'm pretty conservative. I don't really make mistakes. I also don't really like go outside of my comfort zone very much. But when I think about the way that I should be wrestling, it should be like the most physical and intense match that anyone has ever experienced. And that's and I'm technical, but I feel like there's two aspects to a wrestling match. I know there's two aspects to a wrestling match. There's the wrestling and then there's a fighting aspect. And I feel like I was built to be a fighter first and other people are wrestlers and I'm a fighter and I need to make it a fight and then once it's a fight I know I'll win because I, I was that's just the way that I was built and um, I felt like against solace I did a lot of good things technically with snapping and creating pressure and angles and getting to his legs and feeling when he was trying to do any type of tricky throw and stuff like that but most importantly, what I did was make him think that he couldn't wrestle the match with me. And he realized that, I think, early on because it wasn't a wrestling match. It was more of a fight. And it's just going to, I believe, it's just going to get more and more physical and intense And the more that I compete and the more that I train. And um, that's where I want it to be. That's the way that... I, that's the place I feel most comfortable. So how did that revelation come about? You, you revealing how you should wrestle. Was it a gradual thing over the last couple of years that you may have started overthinking or wanting to get overly technical and focusing on that? Did, did that just gradually creep in or because when we look at you on the surface, it seems like you're still that physically dominant wrestler, no matter what. So and I know there's always subtleties with this, especially the, the higher levels you go. So those those little distinctions are, are a little harder to pick up. So when did that more technical mentality start creeping in? And how was it revealed to you? It's like, no, this is how you should be wrestling and committing yourself to that course of action. It's been, I've been figuring it out, you know, for, I'd say like, the last two years or so I've been thinking about this type of stuff and it's not like it's not like the technique is bad and I shouldn't continue to keep growing in those areas because there's a lot of things that if if I become more technically efficient in a position then um it's gonna it's gonna be physical the, like the way that I want it to be so um that's that stuff is good but just through, um, really just through being aware of the way that I feel after I wrestle in tournaments, you know, like when I don't feel, uh, content with the way that I competed, not even, not even because of the result, you know, there's a lot of tournaments that I win that I don't feel that great after. And I don't, I know that's not the way that it should be. I should feel, I should feel content and satisfied and the way that that's going to happen is by me doing it the way that God wants me to. Um, so I kind of just think and visualize and meditate on how I need to compete and thoughts come into my mind. And I listen to the coaches and different mentors that I have in my life and the, where they're leading me. And I kind of put all that together and to come up with this uh, style in my head. And, um, uh, so it's like a combination of a lot of different things, but I, th I would say the most critical aspect is that I was watchful of how I felt of even the way that I felt when I was watching myself compete on video. You know, sometimes I'd watch myself compete on video and I'd be like, I don't like any of this. 
<laughs> any of this looks and like you said it's small things subtle differences that a lot of people couldn't tell unless they were really studying me but now I watched myself compete at the Pan Ams and I was really happy about a lot of the things that I did. And that means that I'm on the right direction. Now with that, is, is there, when you're in competition before you step out on the mat, is there, has there been a mental ch shift in what you're saying to yourself and what you've been, what you previously said to yourself, say, say last year, as opposed to now, what did you say last year? Now, when you step on the mat, what's what's that trigger in your head? I mean, last year, I would say that I was like, I didn't want to be, uh, I didn't want to be like overly confident in my mind about how I was supposed to do things. So I had like, last year, I had this almost like sense of humility in me that it, and it wasn't, now I'm starting to realize that I, it wasn't even humility. It was kind of just like, it was like, um, not like doubt, but I just didn't want to cross the line and say things like, like, for instance, what I tell myself this year is like, I was, I'm made for this and this is my purpose. And, uh, um, like those type of statements give me a lot of confidence and, um, just make me feel way more, um, way more present in each match that I compete in before and after. And then last year, like I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been confident in saying those things because I would have felt like, well, you know, maybe there's something else that I'm supposed to do or whatever. But now I feel really confident in those statements. So I don't even know if any of that makes sense, but that's, it's kind of hard to describe. No, I get it. It's, it's almost like you weren't being negative to yourself. It's not like you were planning negative things, but it's almost like it, it seems like slightly overthinking maybe a little bit. Right. Yeah. Which that, which just, just a little bit of overthinking is, is, an, is enough to put you off. And, and again, it's one of those things where on the surface to the public, when they're watching, it's like, man, he looks great. But to you, it's like, ah, it's just, it just, yeah. Because thinking's never good. Thinking's never good when, when, when you wrestle, right? Um, so the, the other, the other thing that I found interesting, what you were saying is like, you're searching or you're seeking out a certain feeling a physical feeling after the match that, you know, like if I hit this threshold, what is that threshold that you feel you have to hit? It's like, yes, I, I, that's the effort I need to put out there. Well, I mean, honestly, my, the way that I, the way that I want to wrestle is that like physically, it's not really about physically how much I give there because my, you know, I, a lot of time, a lot of, people say that wrestling gets harder as you get older. And um, I don't believe that's going to be the case for me. I think wrestling is going to get easier, easier as I get older because I'm going to get better and I'm going to end matches quicker. Um, so it's not even like, it's not like a, I need to be this tired to know that I put the right amount of energy on the mat um, to feel good about it. But it's more so just the, um, like ferociousness and intensity that uh, happens from the second that the whistle is blown. And if the match ends 25 seconds after that, then that's good and I'll feel good about it. But if I don't bring that type of like, it's almost just like violence, you know, if I don't bring that type of violence, I feel like I was made, I believe I was made, made to be a violent wrestler, like a ferocious wrestler, as I was talking about earlier. And if I don't bring that type of attitude and um, feel to a wrestling mat, that's when I won't be content with what I did. But if I do that, then it doesn't matter to me how I feel physically. So trying to, to put that together. So obviously when you're out there competing, you're focusing on yourself. We, we know that. But is there something 
something tangible that you want to feel from your opponents that knows that you're executing on the level with that attitude? Like, cause you could feel when you're getting into a guy, right? Uh, it's different than just tying up with the guy. Once you affect his mind, it, it alters his body. So is there's, you know, a physical outcome that you're looking from, from your opponents? Yeah. I mean, what I'm looking for is what I'm looking for is, um, for them to just have a defensive frame of mind the entire time we're wrestling and for them to be completely overwhelmed. So, um, like you said, when I'm, I want it to be my match and my way and none of it, even for a second go the way that they thought it would go when they stepped on the mat with me. And like when solace, when I wrestled solace, um, he pushed me out in the first period. And I think that Solace thought that he was going to beat me this match. I could tell by the way that he was warming up. I could tell by kind of, he was like moving his head a little bit, kind of like standing up in his stance the first 30 seconds. And I think he thought that he was going to beat me that match. Um, whereas the matches that we wrestled before, I don't think he thought he was going to beat me. But for some reason, I do think he, th- he thought he was going to beat me in the uh, Pan Am Championships. Maybe because he had been training harder or whatever. I don't know. But then at about the 40-second mark, after he got that push out, and I started pushing him to the edge and snapping him and faking him and moving him. And I feel like from that moment, he no longer was trying to win the match. And all, But all he was trying to do was survive. And he was winning 1-0. But I felt like in that moment, he was no longer trying to win the match. And then I got a takedown at the end of the period. And then he tried to do something kind of crazy and got himself in a trap arm cut. And again, I don't think he was even trying to execute that move. I just think he was like, I need to, I need to, I need to try something or else this match is going to end quickly. So he tried that. And that's kind of like, that's kind of what I'm looking for uh, in my opponents where they have just kind of, they're still on the mat and they're still wrestling, but they're not even they're not even thinking about winning and they're not even thinking about anything that they can do. They're just thinking about how can I survive for the rest of the match and not get embarrassed. Yeah. I think that's something that a lot of people don't, don't understand a little bit, but I think this is the most fascinating part. A lot of, a lot of times when we're out there wrestling people, they think we're looking for a specific setup, but you're almost looking for an emotional response. When he feels this, when he shows this to me physically, it's almost like, is it a sense of like, there's blood in the water and you sense that blood in the water? I do. And because the mind controls the body and, uh, you know, like if I hit somebody in the head with a baseball bat, they wouldn't remember how to, and they got a concussion, they wouldn't remember how to do anything. No, so like there is, there is no such thing as your muscles remembering how to do anything, but it's your mind and the emotions that it releases into your body. And uh, so as soon as somebody starts thinking negatively and starts thinking a particular way in the match, their body um, corresponds with that thought. And all wrestlers know, like you can feel that. We feel it when we train. Um, we can see it when we condition. And, you know, like we all can see when someone is about to quit and especially we can feel it when someone is about to quit or just holding on. And um, that like just gives me a lot of energy. Because that that level of fatigue from your opponent, what they're thinking, it's like it's like an amnesia pill, like it, it blanks your memory, doesn't it? And you just can't function. And once, once that seed is planted, once that, once that first seed of doubt, like, uh, uh Oh, I don't know if I can do this. Once you give in to just the question in your mind, you physically, physically you're done. Right. Exactly. And the great thing, the great thing that I, I love about wrestling is we have all experienced doing that to somebody and then we've all had it done to <laughs> ourselves you know what i mean so we know we know what it's like like you said like it only takes one thought especially in a competition maybe in a practice 
over an hour and a half, you can have that thought and then you can kind of regroup and come back. But in a six minute match, if you have that thought, then it is really difficult to recoup and get back to an offensive mindset. Um, so, and that's a lot, there's a lot of power in having experience that, you know, like I've, I've wrestled a lot of guys I wrestled growing up where I went into deep protection mode, like deep, do not get embarrassed mode because of the way that they were wrestling me. And I, I know when I was doing that, I was like, there, I was in no, there was no chance I was going to win because I wasn't, I didn't even think that was a possibility. Yeah. I mean, because you do, when you get into survival mode, you just want to, you want to walk off the mat on your two feet. You don't want you, because at that point, the alternative is like, holy crap, I could be crawling off the mat the way this is going. And, and I don't, and I know I don't want that level of humiliation. So I, you go into self-preservation mode. It's like, okay, yeah, he got me on the scoreboard, but at least I got my dignity. I can walk off the mat, right? <laughs> so when you get in, when you feel that, when you feel that first physical response from your guy, does that up, up your physical intensity or do you just stay locked in and say, I, let this guy self self-destruct because he's already he's going to come he's going to unfold himself so as long as do you just stay consistent with your pressure and your intensity or once you feel him dip a little bit do you make a jump that's a good question i mean typically one of the things that i've been working on this year is being more patient in regards to the way that um my attack rate in matches because I mean, everybody knows I'm going to shoot and everybody's prepared for the amount of attacks that I'm going to take. But I think um, because I threaten so much with legit attacks, uh, my fakes and snaps are uh, even more threatening to my opponent. So I guess in regards to your question, I would I have the tendency probably to want to. As soon as I feel it, that's it. I want to I wanna try and destroy him right now. But it would be better for me to be patient and better for me to just be consistent with the pressure that I had from the begin- beginning of the match, which, is already, which, which should already be a lot, and just keep that steady throughout the entire, um, throughout the entire uh, match. Like, I would, want, I would want my intensity to stay at the same rate and then – them to uh spike and if you get somebody to spike their emotions then typically they drop down uh to to a worse level later on and that's when things get like really easy and you just start scoring in bunches so i guess moving ahead and looking you know we we know the news and i I actually i was on a, a call with usa wrestling and earlier today and just an update about what's going on it seems like Right now, the plan moving ahead is they're they're just going to copy and paste 2020 into 2021 and kind of replicate similar dates and times. I think that's the hope. The hope is that they can just copy and paste 2020 into 2021. So is there is there some sense with this, you know, with the Olympics being postponed, everything that started clicking to you? Is that an actually an exciting thing? Like, oh. Look where I'm going to be in 2021. Like I knew where I could be in August of 2020, but look out if I have a whole another full year to actually figure this out. Have you been able to turn that into a positive yet? I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've talked to the coaches, uh, the Nittany Line Wrestling Club about it, and um, they always have good perspective and help me um, continue to be like positive no matter what happens and that's the way that's exactly how we're thinking about it and I'm thinking about it just um I I felt I felt like you said I was going to be really felt like I was going to be the best I ever had been on April 5th and I felt like I was going to be the best I ever been on August 5th or whatever date it was going to be when I was going to compete at the Olympics but I am still going to be consistent throughout uh, consistent and disciplined throughout this summer and uh, fall and leading into whatever 
date they may choose for the Olympics and Olympic trials, I'll just be even more ready then because a lot of this stuff is, uh, it's not like a, it's not a brand new, uh, me, but it's just new, you know, like some of the aspects that I'm applying to my wrestling are new and I know that I can get better, uh, a lot better in areas. Um, and just that the length of consistency makes a difference. So when I'm, I know I'll be consistent in um, my mindset and um, visualizing and the diet and the physical training and all that and adding the new techniques and new ways of scoring and uh, game planning and all that type of stuff. And that will just be even more precise on sharp next year. Yeah, I was talking to Carrie Colad earlier in the week. We were, we were doing one of our one of our shows, and he said, this isn't going to affect any of these guys, Matt. He's like, if you're truly committed to being an Olympic champ, he's like, if they postponed it to 2030, guys would take a couple weeks off and then get reset. I'm like, okay, what's my 10-year plan here? Because I'm, I'm committed to this. He's like, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's three months or, or 10 years. He's like, the guys that are truly committed to winning an Olympic title, this isn't going to alter them in mentality their preparations, anything like that. So how, how do you respond to, to, to Carrie's thought with that? I know that's one of the things that I've, that's one of the things that I've actually been thinking about because um, for some people, uh, they're getting towards the end of their career, you know? I mean, and who knows, they might compete for another quad or another couple of years or something like that, but they're getting to the point where they're probably, uh, thinking about moving on. But for me, it's like, I see no end at all in the horizon from, for my wrestling career. I mean, I'm always going to do what God wants me to do and I'm always listening to him, but I would like to compete for another 15 years. You know, my body feels great. My mind feels great. I love training and, uh, I'm just excited to compete. I want to compete every opportunity that I can, where it makes most sense to me um and getting ready to prepare for the trials in the olympics so like like carrie said i mean this even if the olympics got canceled completely it doesn't make it i mean i, I want to wrestle in the olympics but it doesn't make a change in what i'm going to be doing for lord will in the next 15 years like i want to wrestle for a long time and i want to be i don't just want to wrestle but i want to be at the very highest level that I can possibly be at. And to do that, I think there's gotta be, there's gotta be a level of excitement, which you obviously have. But I think when you have a student mentality, like you have, that's what makes the sport exciting. Right. I think, I think when guys start thinking about the end of their career is when they don't get excited about the learning process. They, they're like, this is, this is who I am. I'm just going to perfect who this person is, who this athlete is here. And once you resign yourself to that, perfecting what you know you you what you do currently, the end's inevitable, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I haven't – yeah, I, I would think that it would be difficult to um, continue to apply the same type of open, open, open mind when – you know that uh, this is it. And it's not like you're going to come back and um, continue to compete after this year's Olympics. And I'm not, I don't know if that is going to be anybody on the team, but also I have been around guys who, um, who have retired, you know, and it, it, it was, it, they did impress me with the way that they continue to learn and the way that they continue to, um, taking advice from coaches and stuff like that. And actually, I think that part of it is easier than actually applying it. You know, to apply it takes more time. Um, so, but I, yeah, I mean, I don't have any um, stop in mind. If I can wrestle until I'm 45, then I'll wrestle until I'm 45. You know, like if I'm healthy and ready to go, then I would, I love wrestling. So. And that's what's really impressed me about about Jordan 
and his run over the last 10 years. Like the thing that has impressed me so much about him and people talk about his world titles and Olympics and this and that, but what's impressed me most about Jordan is how he's added to his game, how he's evolved his game. And it's, and it's, adding levels to it. Every, every component is just adding a new feature. And to your point, you were saying, watch out, I'm going to keep getting better over the ne- next 10 years. And and I look, I look at a guy like Jordan and I'm like, that's kind of the blueprint kind of in a way, like this guy never seemed content. He was like, yeah, he had this unstoppable double leg and then he he gets his reattack and then he gets a single leg and he get, gets his ankle laces and his guy, and he just started subtly adding more and more things um, and so is that, is that a guy you kind of look to a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the, that was one of the guys that I was thinking about, you know, like he's, uh, competed for a long time and I'm not sure how much longer he will continue to compete. But the thing that's always been impressive with me is when I watch, when I watch him is he's, uh, just constantly learning. And, um, I think part of the reason why he he's had to be that way is be, out of out of uh out of like necessity you know because <laughs> when you have Kyle Dake and when you have uh <laughs> Isaiah Martinez and Jason Nolf and like you just I mean it's a, if you don't stay if you don't keep learning then I mean that's going to be an issue you know it's it's yeah. not just going to be an issue to when the world it's going to be an issue to make the team here in the United States. So it's like out of necessity, sometimes you have to stay open-minded because if you don't, you know, you'll be out of a job. So. Yeah. Because it's always a series of adjustments, right? And you, you, you saw that you saw like years back when he was battling with, with Dake and, and David to make the team like every year he tweaked it because he knew, he knew those two guys were going to adjust for him too. And they were, they were young. And you know, when you have the benefit of the experience, you know the gains these younger guys will make just just by time in at the senior level. And so, you know, he you've you've got to. And uh, I think he's probably in a way thankful for those guys, right? Yeah, absolutely. I know. I remember talking to Zeke Jones when I first moved out to the training center, and uh, he told me that the guy that he was most thankful for in his career was Sammy Henson because Sammy kept him sharp and, uh, to have somebody in your country that, um, you know, is going to be a real, uh, challenge and test, uh, to keep you ready is a blessing for your wrestling career. So, so how is this all, all the things that we've discussed and I know, at the beginning of the year, a lot of people or not the beginning of this year, but the end of the last year, you know, I'm talking more wrestling seasons, but when you made the, 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 the switch to state college and moved out to, to Pennsylvania, I know there's a, some specific things that you you were looking for and you were obviously you accomplished great things at Ohio state, but you felt the need for more for a change. And how quickly were you, were you able to connect and tap in into those things at Penn State? And do you mind if we talk about that just a little bit? No, it's, yeah, I mean, I was a, I had worked with all the coaches before and uh, trained with Varner since I was a junior in high school and been on trips with Casey and Dave and Zane and Nolf and Bo and uh, Kassar and so like I mean you you and Coach Kale and you get to know all these guys, um, and coach Cody. So, uh, I, it was easy for me to make the transition and for them to, um, for me to understand the way that they did things. And, but the, the way that I went into it was, uh, like I wanted to be completely in, you know, I wanted to, I, I feel, I felt like, um, I needed to give them a hundred percent if they were going to give me a hundred percent. So there were, um, things that like, I, I might not have tried in regards to like mindset and visualizing and 
I've always been pretty open to new wrestling technique, but like those type of things and diet that um, make small differences, maybe half a percent, maybe one percent. I mean, who knows how much of a difference it it makes. Um, but if it makes a difference at all in the positive direction, then it's good. Like those were the, I was I've was, have been really committed to that and just being applying those things in my life. And then I turn, it turns out that I really like the, that type of stuff and it's made a big difference in the way that I feel and, um, mentally and, and physically, and even just being more consistent and disciplined in other areas of my life and not just on the wrestling mat and conditioning and stuff like that has had an impact on the way that I view myself as a competitor. So, um, and just, applying all the small things and being excited about it just like I was everywhere else that I've been. Um, so, so how long, you know, obviously to your, to your point, you've been around these guys and there, there's re relationships were already there before you moved out to, to PA, but even though you're in a new situation, it does take some time to, to fully get on each other's page. And I think that's, it's be, be and it's when, when, when people talk about getting on people's pages, it's more like building a, that's, that's called building a relationship, right? Um, and so how long, even though you had an, an established friendship, did it transition into the coach athlete relationship where you, where you were understanding and you were connecting and the things that they were saying, because it's different. People, people say similar things, but it comes out differently. I'm sure, you know, the things that Travell was telling you were, are, are very similar to, you know, what Kale and Casey are telling you, but just maybe slightly different. So how long did it take to, to get on each other's page or develop that relationship? Yeah, I'd say probably a month and a half, two months, something like that, you know? Um, Cause when you first get there, everything's new and they're trying to figure out the way that you think about things and how open you are to change and um, just the way that you go about training every day now that they're with you. And then um, they're trying to figure out the way that you like to work and what's valuable to you. And um, I'm learning more about how they go about things and the way that they train and all those different things. So um, there's a, a lot of parts to really understanding for me to, there's a lot of parts for me to understand. I think it's probably more challenging for the coach to get a better grip on who the athlete is than for the athlete to understand who the coach is. Um, because I don't know, I guess the competitor is a, a competitor is a complex person and, we're all different we all have different strengths and we all have different things that we like to hear and different uh, attitudes about things. And it takes some time just to, for us to get to know each other in that way. So uh, I would say about two months, a month and a half. Okay. Yeah. But I would, I mean like living with coach kale made a big difference in my mind because uh, I just got to, I feel like it expedited everything. And um, I, was learning from just just how he thinks about the collegiate team and freestyle wrestling and <clears throat> things that he learned about himself when he was competing and got to ask him a lot of questions and stuff like that. So that helped a lot. So I don't I don't really want to get into specifics uh, in your training, but what what are the biggest conceptual things maybe that you've taken away in the last four or five months since you've been in state college, like? The, the the mental concept and maybe the technical or physical concept of wrestling is there did they introduce any any subtle differences in how you're thinking or or how you're approaching your wrestling yeah they definitely have i mean um one thing that i think penn state that the penn state coaching staff and the new line wrestling club is really good at doing is um taking taking somebody and uh applying like the small like the small changes the small uh differences that need to to be applied in your career and 
in all aspects. I mean, if you, there's probably there's mindset, there's um, the physical aspect, there's the technique, the conditioning, and then there's pr- diet, and that's probably all the areas where, and then of course faith, and that's probably all the areas where um, you can improve as a competitor, and they're good at taking. Uh, making sure that you're improving in a small way uh, in all of those areas, like the elite guy, you know, because let's just say for, so that people can understand it. Let's just say that I'm 90, I'm at 90% of my potential. You know, I have like maybe 10% left where I can improve and they're really good at uh, slowly, but surely over time, getting you closer and closer to that hundred percent. And Um, so that's been something that I've been really thankful for, but I mean, in regards to technique and just mindset, the mindset is, uh, you have everything you need. You know, I've, I have everything that I need to, uh, do to wrestle the way that I want to wrestle, wrestle the way that God wants me to wrestle. And the only reason why it wouldn't happen is because, I don't believe that it can happen and I just need to go and do it. I just have to go and do it. I can't let anything stop me. I just have to go and do it. And, uh, technically, technically, uh, they're very good at, uh, opening up your wrestling and, uh, diversifying the way that you attack and, uh, having game plans for everybody that you complete against and being, uh, more strategic in that way. And the other thing that I, I mean, the other thing that I love about, I really like about the Nitty Line Wrestling Club and uh, the staff is that uh, everything's a mystery. You know, people don't, people don't really know a lot about <laughs> the way they do things and the way that they operate. And everybody who's here kind of has, um, like the, to the public, it's a mystery. Like everybody here kind of, they buy into that. And uh, I think there's a lot of power in that where people are like, what are they doing? You know, like what what makes them different? And no one ever talks about it. No one ever gives you a lot of information on it. And uh, unless you're a part of it. And uh, I think there's power in that. And I like. No, without a doubt. I mean, this is one of the things Ben and I would argue about because he would get it all ticked off. Like, why are those so secret? Why are they so secret? It's like they don't you don't you're not owed the right to to what's going on in this program. I like the coaching staff there. Their focus is on the Penn state athletes and the Nittany lion club athletes. They're, they don't need to share anything to anybody. Right. So I think it's as simple as that, but I think in this day and age of, of in, in our information society, everybody feels they're owed something like they, they, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, it, it's uh different philosophies on it, but I like that philosophy. Yeah, cool. Well, I think that's a good a good place to 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 stop. I appreciate you you sharing everything and and catching up. I know, I know of 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 any guy in the world like you have the right perspective, like where where you're at, where your head is, where your belief system is. And I knew it wasn't going to affect you because it doesn't seem anything phases you really and you truly believe it's god's plan um but i appreciate you coming on and and sharing some time with us thank you for having me on matt appreciate it had a lot of fun talking all right kyle hey i appreciate it uh be safe out there and uh we'll be talking to you soon